Hello, Mr. Henry. Thank you for uh, joining us today. We're excited to learn more about Singapore's education system and its progress over the years. Um, before we dive in, could you briefly introduce yourself and your background in education? Sure. Okay. So basically, um, I was educated under Singapore's education system all the way to the mid uh, 19, uh, uh, all the way to late uh, 1978. Okay, from primary school to high school. And then after that, uh, I went overseas after my military service of two and a half years. I was educated in the US. And I came back to Singapore in the 1990s. And uh, so just about 1998, the Ministry of Education embarked in Singapore embarked on uh, switching to 21st century learning. So we embarked on a uh, strategy called uh, uh, learning st uh, thinking schools learning nation so that's where your teach uh, less learn more strategy came from where the government uh, the Ministry of Education was trying to cut down uh, the amount of time our students did road mm -hmm. learning and so back in the 1980s Singapore was at the rock bottom of pizza ranking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're familiar with pizza ranking yes. in English, math, and science. We were at the bottom. And uh, in the 1980s, uh, Singapore was independent in 1965. And uh, so basically, our nation building went very well. And by the 1980s, uh, we had done fairly well as a nation. And our founding fathers, Lee Kuan Yew and uh, Go King Sui, invested in education, where they uh, increased the pay of teachers dramatically and did research. And finally, uh, around that time, they developed and evolved the model of teaching students math in a very different way. So uh, I can dwell into that later if you are interested. But from there, once we develop a new model focused on teacher training uh, and paid teachers better, within, by the end of the decade of the 1980s, we started seeing results. Singapore suddenly popped up on the top of PISA ranking and for the last uh, close to uh, 30 years, Singapore has been on top in English, math and science. Mm, that's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Singapore is known worldwide for its high performing education system. Uh, could you give us an um, overview of how it is structured and some of the key turning points that have shaped its evolution? Okay, so basically, I think uh, one of the first pieces of success for us as a country was investment mm -hmm. in education to uh, give better pay to our teachers, train them better. So you would see that in Singapore, our teachers have very good uh, 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 professional development training. In fact, they are required to go through 100 hours of training every year. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing about many developing nations that I've seen is that, you know, uh, unfortunately, these developing nations don't realize that teacher education is key. Of uh, course. And uh, I was on a trip once to Myanmar, and the teachers back in, uh, this was around 2010, were telling me that, you know, they wanted to be trained on 21st century learning. They backed their MOE for it, and they never got any support. So and that's one, one of the things that I do is mm -hmm. uh, to try to go around the world to offer teachers good professional development training so that we can uplift education around the world. Yeah. Mm, that's interesting. Um, let's talk about the education evolution and key reforms. Singapore has undergone significant e education transformations. Uh, and what were some of the major policies or reforms that played a crucial role in this progress? I think the first thing we did was that uh, we uh, changed our math curriculum drastically. Mm -hmm. Normally, in most countries, we teach algebra to students at grades five, grade six, okay? Mm -hmm. And it is very confusing. Yeah, that's For a young early. child to figure what's X, what's Y, what's A, what's B, what's C. And so what we came out with was a concrete model approach where we show, show the children you know, we draw diagrams for them so that they can see, okay, if uh, A is more than B by how many, we load the number there. Mm -hmm. And through pictorial diagrams and 
one of the most important things is we use a lot of math manipulatives, cubes, rods that represent numbers. Mm -hmm. And now the child can touch and feel the numbers so rather than give better. them an abstract term that they cannot understand what's A, B, C. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that is a big help. And then the other thing that we did was, you know, children get very bored of road learning. You mm -hmm. give them tons of homework, expect them to spend three to four hours doing homework that's repetitive and doesn't benefit them because they already know it. And you're going to lose their interest. So there, there's no homework. So we, well, there is homework, but more challenging homework where we try to use real life problems mm -hmm. in the real world that they have to tackle because that will help them to become problem solvers. Yes. So what we, that's what we try to do with them. And so we cut our curriculum down mm -hmm. and we give them more interesting things where in our curriculum they have to do problem solving. So where they, they are use given their projects. logics. Okay. They are given projects that they have to tackle and solve. And that's where we get a very high ability and a high number of our students being able to tackle problem solving. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we're working, looking at in the real world with STEAM and STEM education. Employers are dying for good workers who can solve problems, yeah, yeah, not actually, give them problems yes. at the workplace. Mm, yeah. That's very interesting, actually. Yeah. And that also mm, makes the students want to hard work. Yes, maybe. correct. It keeps them interested because they yeah, know they are interested. solving real life problems and it's meaningful and helpful for them. And what is the age that where a child begins to go to school? Okay, so in Singapore, we start our kindergarten uh, preschool mm -hmm. education at age three. At and three, then okay. so they spend uh, uh, a, a two years in play school. Mm -hmm. And then by they, they spend kindergarten one, kindergarten two, that means they are about five, six years old. And then by seven, they'll go to primary one. Mm, and okay. they spend six years in primary school. And then at the end of... Uh, uh, year three, mm -hmm. we diagnose all our students for giftedness. Mm -hmm. So we see whether they are gifted, and that's where we identify the top 1% of our students and put them into nine special schools where they get specialized education from teachers to make sure that we can upskill up them very quickly. Mm -hmm. yep. And then primary six, they take the national exams that will determine with what secondary school, the high school they'll go to. And it's very important because once you're in a good high school, that basically determines your success later at the high school level. Mm -hmm. But what abilities uh, does a child need to have for you to think that they're gifted? So basically, uh, we focus a lot of our education on higher order thinking mm -hmm. skills. So basically, the ability to identify patterns, mm -hmm. sequences. So a lot of these things are covered in the math Olympiad, okay? And mm -hmm. so uh, that's why once a kid embarks on a math Olympiad curriculum, they pick up these special skills. I, I, I think the reason why we are so successful is because many of these topics are not really taught in the school mathematics curriculum, but because math Olympiad focuses on helping children to do well in competitions, and there are a lot of very nice tricks in the math Olympic curriculum that uh, become like a magic box. You know, mm -hmm. and once kids are exposed to it and they learn a special way of solving something very quickly, it's like learning magic. Mm -hmm. And every child likes to succeed. And so when kids are exposed to this kind of curriculum, they get very excited. And then they realize that they have magic on their hands and they start to outperform and perform, you know, uh, versus other kids who are not trained in this style of curriculum. Uh, despite its success, every system has challenges. What are some current challenges uh, Singapore faces and how is it planning to stay adaptable for the future? Well, you know, uh, with every successful nation, what uh, some of the challenges you have is the pressure on the students to perform, you know, when they see their classmates doing so well, mm -hmm. they feel very pressured. So. Definitely, mental stress is a key issue. And our ministry has, uh, in the last uh, five years, has taken a very serious look at this. So we have psychologists put into our schools, uh, secondary initially, and now even at the primary school level, they have a psychologist 
to guide these students who are uh, experiencing behavioral problems so that we nip the problem in the bud and not let it grow to an excessive problem which could be dangerous for mm -hmm. any of the students and teachers in the school. Mm. That's yeah. interesting. Uh, let's talk about quality innovation and student well-being. Uh, Singapore consistently uh, ranks among the top in the global education rankings. Um, what are the key factors behind the success and how does the system ensure a balance between academic excellence and student well-being? Well, uh, in our school system, uh, they have designed uh, the assessment of these kids into a few areas. So part of it is academics, part of it is what we call uh, CCA, is co-curricular activity, mm -hmm. where the students are encouraged to pick up a hobby that they enjoy, whether it's playing music, okay, or playing badminton, or soccer, you know, so that they can uh, uh, train themselves to balance studies versus some physical activity mm -hmm. that will give them an outlet uh, to, to give them a very good balance in life. So I think we have done a very good job in that area. So we've got fantastic opportunities for kids where, you know, besides uh, studies, uh, robotics club, uh, uh, gardening club, they also have uh, all these uniform groups like uh, the Boy Scouts, uh, even the uh, we introduce an uh, element of our military service where they are national cadet corps, in, uh, like a soldier while they're in the army. Mm -hmm. So they practice all this to build up their national consciousness. So a uh, broad base of different things to capture the uh, interests of the children because every child is different. You mm -hmm. cannot have one size to fit everybody. Yes. So we have different interests so that everybody can find their niche to be successful and thereby, once they are successful, they enjoy it, they start to do well. So basically, you give them chances yes. to choose um, their own future. Yes. Mm, that's great. Yeah. And about the Olympiads and their impact on students, is there anything that you want to say at first? Well, I would say that uh, it is a very good opportunity for students uh, to participate in that because uh, I've seen many, many average students. Mm -hmm. The moment they come into uh, each of these areas, they learn special, they pick up skills, okay? They pick up recognition. And the best of all is that these skills, they don't learn in schools. Mm -hmm. So they are able to pick up, you know, just like magic. They pick up some special tricks that make them stand out. And every child likes to succeed and stand out to mm -hmm. show off to their friends that, hey, you know, I can do this. Yes. And that's so true. I think uh, that's the magic in edu education that we need to uh, ignite our children with so that they get interested and uh, involved and they want to participate in it to make them successful in, in their mm -hmm. school. So that's what we have done with the Olympiads to give them many opportunities to pick up the skills, get the recognition. And what we do here at SIMCC is also to help many of our students get into some of the best mm -hmm. universities with scholarships. So it's kind of a way to motivate them. Yeah. Uh, what about, um, were there any situations where they could get uh, demotivated by like well, this? I mean, definitely when they try to compete, uh, one of the things that the students must bear in mind is that you're not going to be successful every time. Of course, yeah. You know, with any failure mm -hmm. that comes along, it's a chance to reflect mm -hmm. and find out why you didn't do well and, and put hard work to it. So mm -hmm. I have a very good example. Uh, I had a grade three student. He took the contest the first time. He didn't do well. All his friends got an award. He got nothing. Mm -hmm. But he took action. He went to his father and said, Dad, you know, I'm very disappointed and I need help. The father approached us and we gave him some resources and he worked on it. By the next year, for the next two years, he got a perfect score. And the year after, at grade six, he got into the top school in Singapore. Mm, so and he tried just, to get there. Correct. Just two years ago, he got into two medical schools, universities, after graduating from high school. Well, that's something to be proud of. Correct. So, you know, a it, it very important mindset for the kids is that, you know, as we try to take challenges, there are two outcomes. Mm -hmm. You win or you lose. 
course. And not to take that's how life to, works. Correct, so. Not to take yes, correct, exactly, and that's what we do. We train them for life. Mm-hmm. You know, these are life skills. Mm, that's great. Uh, about the Olympiads and their impact on students, uh, beyond academic knowledge, what essential skills do students develop through Olympiads? And do you believe all students should participate or are they more suited for a specific group maybe? Well, I mean, uh, I would say that not everyone is suited to do the Olympiads. As mm-hmm. long as they are average and above, it's something worth trying because that could ignite. Uh, I've, I've turned a lot of students from average students to high achievers. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and once uh, you hit their interest level and their passion, they transform. So I would say it's not for everybody. So especially the weaker ones, we need to do more remedial work to get them to perform uh, better in school. Mm-hmm. And then they may have that opportunity to pursue some of these opportunities later on. Okay. What can other countries learn from Singapore's approach to education and what advice would you give countries uh, looking to improve their education system? I think a very important part would be uh, to give students hope, Mm -hmm. opportunities. I think what Azerbaijan has done, I'm very, very happy to learn of what Azerbaijan has done for your children. Uh, So from what I know, if an Azerbaijan student gets into a good university, gets uh, a mission into a good university, mm-hmm. your government, MOE, will give them a scholarship mm-hmm. uh, to study there. And so I think that is hope. And uh, it's a very good seed to plant in a nation uh, to help your students grow because they see the opportunity that they have. Uh, if they work hard, there are opportunities for them. Mm-hmm. They so, will be appreciated. Yes. Yes, true. That's a good reason to be motivated yes. and try hard. Yes. Thank you so much for these valuable insights. Before we end, is there anything else you want to share about Singapore's education? Well, uh, what uh, we did was a very systematic approach to improving our education. We were at the rock bottom in the uh, early to mid 1980s. And within a span of less than 10 years, we became the top in pizza ranking in Mm -hmm. English, math and science. And I would say that this is something that if a country devotes itself to improving the quality of their teachers, their education system, uh, provide opportunities for their students, they can be another Singapore. That's a great success. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay.